Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you another interlude episode of Roto Ballers Official MMA Podcast. Tap that. And this is a special one because, as you might know, I've been doing a lot of XFL, USFL content, USFL season kicking off this Saturday, April 15th. This is the first week that we have an XFL and a USFL game week, the same week. And here with me tonight to discuss this beautiful time in American history, he is the reporter for, uh, he he writes for the, uh, he writes XFL Renegades content for the XFL News Hub and Houston Gamblers content for the USFL News Hub. Anthony Miller. Anthony, thanks so much for being here tonight. What's up? Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Excited to uh, have our conversation. So first off, let's just let's just start it with the XFL to this point in the season. Um, let's talk about the Renegades, which we both enjoy watching. And Anthony, I don't know what it is about this team. I still can't figure it out. I know it started with me being interested in the Kyle Sloter and Sal Canella combo transferred to Arlington but at this point with as weird as their season has been I still really like them and I can't point my put a finger on why that is yeah the Renegades are they're probably the weirdest team in the XFL to be honest they're they're, they got a weird combination of defensively they're one of the best in the league they lead the league in turnovers created with 19 they have a I mean they're they're so deep at every position on the defensive side they've They've had they've had three defensive uh, defensive backs on IR. They have two or three linebackers on on IR. Like they've had a lot of injuries, but they're so deep at every position that anyone can step up and re- be able to play well. They're, so that defense is absolutely incredible. And a lot of credit goes to the defensive coordinators Jay Hayes and Tim Lewis for the job they've done because they've done a phenomenal job. But this offense is it's a show shaky. It's it's really up and down. You're not really sure what kind of offense you're going to get week after week. A lot of that has to do with kind of the instability at the quarterback position and the quarterback's not really being able to run the offense that John, uh, offensive coordinator Jonathan Hayes wants to run and offensive coordinator Chuck Long. So I think that plays a lot into it as well. The receiving core also, like no one's really broken out as the top target. Sal Canelo has kind of been their top receiver up until – uh, last week where he was shot out of a catch for the first time uh, all season. So there's not really that one player. I mean, Tyler Vaughn's is kind of rising up as potentially the number one guy for the running gates, but none of them have really broken loose. The one Winningham's gotten usually has one really good catch a game, but there's so much instability there at the receiver position. Offensive line is solid. Uh, Devion Smith and Letty Brown are really good in the backfield. I think they're a great combo. I, I think Luis Perez is a great addition to the team. I thought he played a really good game last week. But, yeah, I just, I just, it's a weird team. Like, special teams is fantastic as well. I can't forget to mention Taylor Rosarino and uh, Marquette King. They've been phenomenal for the Renegades this year. So, I, I think it's just because how weird their, their offense is. They're, they're, you know, they're four and four, they're, they're, they're average. It's just, you never really know what you're going to get out of them week after week. And it's such a typical team, like at where they at, where they're at in their record and the way that their wins have come, we really no more than 18 points in any single victory, Uh, you know, at least over the most recent sample size. But, you know, this is a team where the MVPs really that have got them to this point have been the tight end, Running back Davion Smith, who like is about as solid as you get in the league, considering that the offensive scheme that he's in, you know, Abram Smith, obviously having an MVP caliber season. There's a lot of running backs having a good time, but Davion Smith has been like a, a, a rock. Uh, it wrote, you know, he kind of like Jock, what Jock has Patrick or Jock Patrick has offered to the Brahmas in that, you know, you can get about four yards per catch or carry out of them and you know they lean a lot on those guys but the renegades defense just holds up week after week and it seemed like the offensive line was a problem early on in the season and you know it's like a a guy like kyle sloter is with along with ben denucci they might be the the two quarterbacks in the world that you would not want to roll out there with an unreliable offensive line they're they're not risk averse quarterbacks. They're going to make mistakes, but Luis Perez seems like a really good fit for this renegades offense. 
Yeah, I think Luis Perez is exactly the type of quarterback at, uh, co-offensive coordinator Jonathan Hayes wants. Um, he likes to do a lot of um, short passes, so five, eight yard, you know, crossers or just quick out routes or screen passes. And I think Luis, Luis Perez is perfect for it. For w- one reason, I mean, Luis Perez is not the type that's going to bomb passes down the field. That's just not the way he plays. He's, he's, he's like a game manager where he's going to protect the football, but he's not going to blow you away with his stats. Um, you, know, you know, at the same time for Luis, you know, he's not a mobile quarterback either. You know, he's going to stand in the pocket. He'll be able to make those throws that you need him to make. So I, I think he's been a really good fit for what Jonathan Hayes needs. He needs a more stable game managing quarterback to kind of handle it. I think the offensive line has played a lot better over the last few weeks. I think a lot of that has to do like, I think Mike Horton is one of the best offensive linemen in the XFL. He's done a phenomenal job run blocking. He's the best run blocking uh, guard in this league. And he's done a great job of, open up those holes for Devion Smith. And you were talking about like Devion Smith is, you know, he's one of those guys, he's going to automatically get three, four yards a carry and his stats won't blow you away. He's going to do 10 to 12 carries a game, 45 to 50 yards a game. Like those, those aren't mind blowing stats, but he does exactly what he's, he's needed to do. And it's to pick up those, you know, those extra three, four yards. And I know Bob Stoops, uh, coach Bob Stoops spoke very highly of Devion Smith uh, about a week ago where he talked about, you know, he's kind of the workhorse. He's the, he's the leader on that offense who, you know, you need to get those tough yards. You give him the ball and he's going to go get it. And, you know, with the way the quarterback situation was handled in Arlington, kind of, you know, through the first half of the season, uh, I don't know how confident I would be that Bob Stoops would do this, but the acquisition of Kelly Clark, it seems like that would be a perfect renegade's answer to the Derek King of what he offers the defenders or what Cole McDonald comes in and does, uh, you know, for the roughnecks. It seems like that could be, you know, something that could put them over the edge against some of these opponents that they've been missing out on by two or three points. That's true. I, I think that's a good point. Um, I just don't think it's the type of offense that they want to run. Um, you know, I thought it was going to be more of what Jonathan Hayes ran like three years ago with the St. Louis Battlehawks with Jordan Tiamu, where they would lean on more of, you know, the mobile quarterback and being able to do RPOs and, uh, you know, just run those type of plays. And it, it really hasn't been that case. I think what's missing from the Renegades is I, I just don't think they have the deep threat they need. You know, I, I think Tyler Vaughn's is a really good possession receiver, but he's not one that's going to, you know, blow you away and be able to blow past the, the corners. He's not a speed guy. You know, I, I think Victor Bolton Jr. was supposed to be that guy. Um, unfortunately, he just hasn't been able to stay healthy for them the last couple of weeks. So I, I think they were kind of hoping he'd be the big play guy. Uh, Javante Payton's got potential to be the big play guy, but, you know, he's only had maybe one or two of those. So I, I think the I think the main problem lies is they just don't have any deep threats at receiver. I think they've tried to bring them in, and unfortunately, it just hasn't worked out. So if they had that big play receiver that can go down the field and be able to make a long catch, that would make a difference. I think Juan Winningham has potential to be that guy. He's just not a speed guy, but he's a guy that – you know, if you're in a goal line situation, you just need to throw it up to a tall receiver. Juan Whittingham is going to be that guy. But again, they need a deep threat. I, I just don't think they 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 really have any type of receiver that's like that. If Victor Bolton can stay healthy, he could be that guy. And so let's let's round out talking about the South Division because the South Division it's been like following the Big Ten West in football. Like everybody is around the same record. You depending on the circumstances of the game. It really could be a 50-50 matchup. I mean, take the, the Guardians were, you know, eliminated as of their most recent loss. And yet that is one team. That's the only team in the South right now that I could say with any confidence actually could beat the defenders on any given night because they actually did it. Yeah, the South Division is it's just odd because the Guardians have played a lot better over the last three to four weeks. A lot of that has to do with Quentin Dormy and the job he's done at quarterback. I think he's been really good up until the Renegades game. Then he had five turnovers and he looked really bad. But a lot of that has to do with offensive line just really didn't protect him well. Uh, receivers had some drops. It, it was a really sloppy game from the Guardians side. So I think the Guardians have the capability. Right now, they they probably have the best offense 
in the South Division, which is surprising to say because the Roughnecks for the first, first four weeks of the season had the best offense in the XFL up until uh, Kirkland got hurt. After Kirkland got hurt, that offense just went downhill. And it, it, it's a shame because I think Brandon Silver just had a good year. You know, they have Max Borgie. They they have a lot of weapons. I know uh, uh, Burnett has been a guy that has really stepped up a receiver, but Roughnecks don't really have any burners at receiver. You know, Burnett's a really good receiver, but he's just not a burner. And then you look at San Antonio, I mean, that offense just – they can't do anything. I, uh, Patrick's been really great at running back. He is, uh, you know, when Caleb Balach got hurt, Patrick went in there and has just ran the ball incredibly well to the point where I consider him probably the second or third best running back in this league behind Abram Smith. So he's done a great job. But the quarterback position, they've literally had four different quarterbacks played for them. And when you have that instability at quarterback, you're not going to win games. So, yeah, the South Division is just it, it, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, I still think the Roughnecks are the, obviously the best team in that division, but I think for the Renegades, I, I feel a lot better about how, you know, about the Renegades chances of being the Roughnecks next week, just because I, I just think that division is kind of all over the place. There's not really a dominant team. Well, you know, take, yeah, Houston, when they started off with that undefeated handful of games, it, the question was who's the best team, DC or Houston? But Houston started playing teams that were actually good or playing well at the time, and they got completely exposed. Certainly, the options for Brandon Silvers are not there with John Trey Kirkland out. But at the same time, like they have died, they have looked considerably worse with each given week. You know, the the much lesser capacity to score points. But there was a moment, and it was a fleeting moment, grant you, Anthony. But there was a moment during that Roughnecks Brahmas game where I actually had to wonder who was playing better, Brandon Silvers or Jack Cohn. Yeah, Brandon Silvers had a. I, it, it just looks like he's not a hundred percent healthy. Um, you know, they, there's been speculation about you know he was out uh, two weeks ago because it, it was either an arm injury or an elbow injury that I, that that really wasn't clear itself. But it definitely looked like I don't know if Brandon Silvers is a hundred percent healthy, but. I, I hate to say this because I think Cole McDonald has great up, you know, he's got great potential to, to be a starting quarterback in this league. I, I just, I would take an 80% Brennan Silvers over a 100% Cole McDonald right now. Cause even when Cole McDonald made his start, he didn't look great either. I mean, he just wasn't accurate with the football. I think Silvers has a little bit of a better chance of protecting the football. I know he threw two picks against San Antonio, but I mean, think about this too. San Antonio's defense is absolutely elite. I, I think they are one of the best defenses in the league. That's the one thing that I can absolutely say about the South division is I think the defenses are stronger in the South division than the North, the Roughnecks, Renegades and Brahmas have, I think they have top four defenses. Now or Orlando's got the worst defense in the league by far. I think that's a horrible defense, but every one of those other teams has a great defense, which could add to why they're super competitive. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the games where the Renegades have been in it, the San Antonio Brahmas have been in, in those games. And the only reason why is because of their defense. And their defenses have been so good. That's the weird thing about the Brahmas and the Renegades, man. And like the Renegades, look, I mean, just marginally better on offense every single week than the Brahmas have, and, and which which is what makes that loss to San Antonio so frustrating. Um, mm. But like their defenses really are strong enough to where it's like you know if the Battle Hawks play the Defenders tomorrow, or or it's Seattle, I think maybe is a better example. You know, they might beat Seattle twenty eight to twenty. But if St. Louis plays, you know, Arlington tomorrow, like that game might be like 18 to 16. And either way, you know, that it comes out. Yeah, I mean, you think back early in the season between St. Louis and Arlington, I mean, that, that game at one point, St. Louis would only scored like 11 points through two and a half, three quarters. And then it really took to the fourth quarter for them to even just get past Arlington. And if Arlington, you know, had – a better offense at that point, or even a half decent offense in that game, they might they they had a pretty good chance of winning that game. That defense played really well. They really got the agent McCarron and really rattled him. But it, it was just too little, too late, where the offense just couldn't do anything. So I mean that that defense was just left on the field too long, and that's really been the problem with the Renegades all season. Is just they're not winning the time of possession, and their defense is being told to stay on the field thirty to forty minutes a game and try to try to win the contest for them. And unfortunately that's not, 
that's not a good recipe for victory. And it's ended up hurting the Renegades in the process. A lot of that has to do with their offense. And that's what makes this league so crazy, man. It's like, I can barely like take into account the first handful of weeks for the Renegades because like this, that's not the situation at quarterback for them anymore. Uh, and you know, the guardians on any given week now, whoever their opponent and the Vipers too, like, you know, they made changes at quarterback and you know, at least it's an adjustment, you know, you're, you're seeing these teams make adjustments and at least they're playing spoiler and, you know, kind of to transition to what's going on in the North division, you know, you got the Seattle sea dragons. I'm, I'm wearing my Sea Dragon shirt right now. My wife is actually wearing my Renegade shirt that was originally a large that shrunk in the laundry. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Sea Dragons just last week signed Philip Lindsay and a, a former all uh, a, a former Pro Bowl running back in the NFL. And it was kind of the answer they needed because you could tell that the field was just not quite as open as Ben DiNucci needed when Morgan Ellison was no longer a part of the picture. And that's a team that I just, everybody loves to watch. They're, they're really fun to watch because of their offense, but that offense dipped hard in the middle of the season. And their defense is what has carried them through to this point and gives them a chance at the postseason. But even with every game, even with the, probably their best game that they played all season being this last week against the defenders, even though it resulted in a loss, I still don't know what I think would happen if they played the Battle Hawks to you know tomorrow or this week if AJ McCarron is playing. Yeah, so with Seattle, I I think a big reason they struggled in some games a, a lot of this has to do with turnovers. So Ben DiNucci, I mean, it is what it is. I know Jim Haswell's really frustrated. Sometimes he's like dude, I'm going to kill you because of all these <laughs> turnovers you have, but he, he's, he's a gunslinger. I mean, he, he, that's kind of the risk you have with, with Danucci. Um, really good mobile quarterback. I mean, he know he is really smart with how he uses his, his legs and being able to pick up those yards. He's really been their, their big running game over the last few weeks. The problem with Morgan Ellison was one, he couldn't stay healthy, but two, he, he, he had turnover problems himself. I mean, he was just fumbling the ball too much. And I, that was something that was really frustrating Jim Hassel to the point where he didn't want to put him on the field anymore, even though he's like one of the best running backs in this league. So that's where Philip Lindsay really comes into play where th- that dude literally came into the XFL with, I'm trying to think of the number. I think it's 1,180 carries consecutive carries without a fumble i mean that's the exactly the type of running back seattle needs and i I, i'm i think the big reason why they lost that dc game was because they they couldn't really establish the run as much he had philip Lindsay had 18 eight eight carries for 23 yards danucci only had 23 yards they just really couldn't get that running game going but i i think next week it will be better for seattle when they run the ball i think they just need to get more consistent with that but a, a lot of it has to do with turnovers and then in terms of, you know, St. Louis, I, I, you know, AJ McCarron, I think is one of the MVPs of this league. Him and Jordan Tiamo are going to battle it out for that MVP spot. But just because of how consistent AJ McCarron's been, how accurate he's been, he's been phenomenal for that St. Louis team. The one thing that's hurt St. Louis is, you know, Brian Hill's been great this year, but he's had fumbling issues himself. He's got to learn how to protect that football too. If he can learn to protect the football, that St. Louis team can make the playoffs. And I think they could be very dangerous um, especially if they go up against DC. Oh yeah, Brian Hills put the ball on the ground like four or five times, like in the last two weeks. Um, and you know, you got to take the last week, you know, close victory over Vegas, obviously with a grain of salt because AJ McCarron was not in the game. But like, that should still be a. I, Last week was so weird because there was a couple of calls at the end of that game, man, that didn't make any sense. And this is the other thing about the XFL. I enjoy it so much more when I'm watching it on my computer on mute because I, let's let's take a little diversion, all right? Let's talk about the fact that we want this league to succeed and have, you know, seasons for years to come, man. I, I see it in, you know, what we're both doing on the internet all the time is like, we want this to survive. And part of the weird thing about the XFL is their weird obsession with stuff that I cannot figure out who is asking for more of. The the constant, uh, 
focus on the in-game interviews that are inappropriate sounding at half the time because the dude like just got finished with a pick six and is breathing hard. And the answer to the question is like, yeah, I made the read, made the play. And they're like, thank you very much. And then the um the, the Dean Blandino thing, like half the time when I look down, he's on the screen. Uh, what do you think about one, you know, how the league has handled the, you know, the image that they're protruding to the public so far this year, because it's been a roller coaster. And then the fact that, you know, against historical odds, the, the rating, the TV ratings actually took an uptick over the last week or so. All right. So that's a, that's a loaded question. So I I will, no, you're good. So I will start with the sideline interviews. So I actually don't have a problem with it necessarily. Um, Yeah. I I haven't had any concerns about the sideline. I get what you're saying though, where a lot of these players are kind of giving generic responses. I think, I think what they need to do is the, the league needs to be able to maybe before the season, try to figure out, who are the characters of the league? Who's going to be the ones that are going to give them the best responses and go with that. Cause I will say, I I do have to make one complaint Um, in the St. Louis game. They had um, the YouTuber destroying, I think his name is. so bad, dude. It was so bad. I I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It was really cringeworthy for the third quarter. And um, I'm trying to think. I think it was Spring Football Zone who like brought it up on Twitter, where it was like, "Man, I just want to watch the full game. Like, I want to see the full screen in the game and not the like destroying on the screen for the whole quarter." So I I agree with that. I I did not like that. Now I will say in the San Antonio game they had, I believe it was Mike Scott, who uh, they kind of had talked through some of the plays. He has he has he he's a good character. And I think he was able to talk through the plays really well. So I like that portion where they can get the players to actually talk through, okay, this is what we're seeing on the play. You know, we're trying to identify this and this. He's going to probably do, you know, this swing move to try to get past the defender. Like that part is really cool. I wouldn't do it like play after play at the play, but it's cool to see like a player too, just having a, a, you know, one of the players actually talk through like, okay, this is what we're seeing on offense is what we're seeing on defense. This is what we need to do and stuff like that. That part is really cool because you're educating your fans on the game of football. A lot, a lot of us are just average football fans who maybe have never played the game of football, but being able to hear that aspect and try to get into the heads of the players. I love that part. That part, that transparency is so awesome to have. And I would, I, I, I kind of hope the NFL will inherit that because I would love to be able to, you know, hear, you know, when Tom Brady was playing, like, let me hear him, his head when, you know, like when he's going through a play or something like that, even if it's preseason, like let him talk through it. I think that'd be cool to see. Second, Dean Blandino. Um, <laughs> I, I will say it, it, it's a weird relationship right now with Dean Blandino right now, because of course I love the transparency, the officiating being to see, you know, hearing them talk through like, what is he seeing and stuff like that. I think the concern I've had with Dean Blandino is there's been a lot of times where it's been kind of inconsistent on how he's explaining the, like how he talked through a penalty or talked through, you know, where the ball was spotted and stuff like that. Like his explanations, it's been kind of inconsistent at times. And at times. Yeah. Like it's been, it's, it's kind of tough because there are times where you're like, well, in the NFL, that's like a hundred percent of pass interference call. And then all of a sudden, it's really not here. So, um, you know, Andrew Murray was talking about uh, one of the writers for XFL News. So he was talking about this on the Marcast, where he kind of brought up. It's like it, it almost feels like Dean Blandino is trying to do his own interpretation of the rules and stuff like that. But he's not really sure about how it is. But sometimes it comes off like that. And I, I, I kind of agree with Andrew on that. So yeah. I, I, I think it'd be interesting to hear, you know, Dean Blandino's side and how he kind of walks through a play. I know he kind of talks about it on the broadcast, but sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment, you're in the heat of the game, there may be other things he's talking about. I want to see him like kind of in a stress-free, uh, stress-free environment and actually talk through um, how he's going about it. The thing is, man, he doesn't have like, you know, any legit credentials for like what he's doing. And that that's the the thing that bo- it, I love the idea of transparency. Uh, you know, if you feel that the 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 transparency that the league any league is offering is authentic, 
then I absolutely love that. And I think it's a great thing for any sport. I just wish they had someone better doing it. And, you know, it, it's it has really become like a, a weird focal point of every broadcast. It seems like he's on the screen. And, you know, to get back to dude, I keep forgetting what that YouTuber's name was. But that was part where I was actually driving in northern Kentucky and I couldn't watch the game. So I was listening to it through my car. And oh, so you, the, you probably had no idea what was going on because the Stroyan was just not talking. Like he was just like, oh, 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 look at that play. Like he, yeah, that was not commentating at all. In fairness, I like, I can't necessarily blame him, you know, because they're the ones who put a YouTuber on the screen to talk about a football game. And like the questions they're asking him aren't exactly conducive to like great commentary on football. It just seems like a weird, like, wait, if you're going to go for an influencer, go ahead and just fork over the cash for Jake Paul. I I think that'd be a way better investment. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously that's ridiculous, but like not all too out of the realm of possibility in the year 2023. I, I think that here's what I will say, though. I think the league has actually recovered in their marketing approach over the last few weeks because, you know, we all saw the same advertisement for the XFL. If you have a Hulu subscription, you are like super aware of the advertisement that was played. And a lot of the, you know, emphasis on the league has been on the rock, obviously, because he's, you know, a very famous person. I feel And, you know, this is from, again, you know, I do prefer to watch a lot of ESPN broadcasts of sports I love on mute uh, to get, you know, that a little bit more distraction free so I can, you know, judge it a little bit more objectively myself. But it seems like the last few weeks with the XFL, there's been a little bit more emphasis on the individual players and, you know, the the talent that should be carrying this league. I 100% agree. I I think that's... Look, at the beginning of the year, it was all about, hey, look at Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Look at Danny Garcia. Look at the league they built. Look at the work they've done beforehand. And that was a lot of what they were focused on with the Player 54 uh, episodes. The first episode or two, it was really about them building this league and getting them started, which, which is cool. But I think at the end of the day, us fans really care about the coaches and we care about the players. That's why we follow these alternative football leagues. It's not, you know, who owns the league while it is – awesome like it was incredible to meet Dwayne the Rock Johnson in person when he was in Arlington for that first home game like that was an awesome moment to see him and you know see him hype up the fans like that's awesome but at the end of the day we're there we're there to hear the stories of the players and hear the stories of the coaches like that one Seattle Sea Dragons uh, lineman who literally gave up college to or his eligibility for college to go play in the XFL like that's a story I want to hear Like, I want to hear somebody who's willing to give up and willing to do whatever it takes to become a professional football player. Like, that's why that's why we cover these leagues. That's why we're here. You know, and hearing the the coach story, like Anthony Beck, this was the head coach for the St. Louis Battlehawks. He literally, you know, kept pressing on who do I need to talk to with the XFL to get my name out there? Like he did everything he took to get into the XFL. Now he's a head coach and now he is leading a six and two St. Louis battle Hawks team. Like that is an incredible story of perseverance and doing whatever it takes. This was a guy that wanted to be a head coach. He wanted to be part of the XFL and he got his foot in the door and now he's succeeding like that. AJ McCarron playing for, he wants his, he wanted his kids to watch him play. That's why he joined the XFL. Like those are the stories that need to be driving this league and they've done a really good job and like you said they've done a really good job over the last month or so really focusing on that part and i think that's where they're going to be able to start growing from this point forward because hopefully they'll have a lot of players that will come back to the xfl uh next season and be able to build those characters so that they have key pieces key stars in each team to be able to tell those stories year after year Well, you know, I don't think at the beginning of the year they really knew what their identity was, and I don't think they would know, you know, I think they knew with Seattle. I think Seattle was a very sure thing to be, like, a decently marketable team. But even, like, their home attendance, you know, it's not what some of these, you know, smaller venues have been like. You know, I think the two strongest home field advantages in the XFL are pretty strongly D.C. and St. Louis. Um, But, you know... It is good to see it. And AJ McCarron is a dude I was very wrong about at the beginning of the year. That's a guy that I looked at and I was like, 
that guy is, you know, getting severely overhyped because he has a more famous name than, you know, even, you know, I mean, by far than the rest of the league, even the guys that are like spring football gods like Tamu and uh, Perez, uh, you know, McCarron carries a different level of fame. And I thought like, dude, this guy's old. He like, he has not played that many snaps of even professional football, but you know, he has come through and did basically what he did for the University of Alabama. So I, I can't fault the dude. And he is, I, I, it's hard to have him as my, you know, number one on the MVP ladder because I think Brian Hill has actually been more valuable to that Battlehawks offense than A.J. McCarron has by a narrow margin. But, you know, where what would you put as your top three MVP ladders so far for the XFL season? Because I think mine currently stands Abram Smith, number one. Jordan Tomo has made a meteoric rise through my MVP ladder this year to number two, and Brian Hill at number three. And I think it rounds out with McCarron and then Ben DiNucci at number five. Yeah, so I'm going to disagree with you about Brian Hill. Um, I think he's put him in, put that team in a lot of positions where they almost lost games because of him. I would say, and you looked at that offense last week, I think Nick Tiano did a, did a good job under the circumstances, but it's very clear to say that offense is a lot better with A.J. McCarron. Like, if Nick Tiano starts all season long, they're not 6-2. and two. A.J. McCarron's the real deal. Um, he's probably the most accurate quarterback in this league. He's probably the smartest quarterback in this league. I would give A.J. McCarron a lot more credit, but I agree. I think Abram Smith is probably number one right now. I, I am so tempted to put Jordan Tiamu at number one just because of what he's done over the last three, four weeks. He, like you said, he has had a unbelievable run the last three, four weeks for this team. He has carried this team on his back. And I think what's been really good is they kind of taking the running game out of his hands a little bit. It felt like the beginning of the year, they wanted him to be more of the running quarterback, like him and De'Ara Kane. They wanted both of them to be the running quarterbacks, but over the last three, four weeks, they've put a lot more trust in him to be like, you know what? Go sling it. Go throw the ball around. Let's see what happens. And look what he's doing. He's averaging almost 200, what, around 240, 250 yards a game. He's throwing three, four touchdowns a game. He's protecting the football. He's been he's been phenomenal. And I think an underrated portion about Jordan Te'amu is the way his passing. I think he's a really good passer. People kind of forget that because of his mobility. And that was something that we saw in the USFL last year, being one of the top five rushers in the league. Now we're getting to see him display his passing. Honestly, this is the best he's ever looked. And, I, you know, with weeks like the one he's had the last few weeks, that dude is literally showing, like, I, I think he's ready to go back into the NFL and be a legit two, number two, number three quarterback in the league. So I would say Jordan Tiamu, I agree, number two. Abram Smith, he's been phenomenal. I mean, he has just been a, dy a dynamic runner. He's averaging 80 to 90 yards per game. I mean, there's multiple games he's having over 100 yards. He had that 217-yard game against St. Louis. He's been absolutely phenomenal, and he's put himself in a position where – the XFL will not see him come back next year because he's definitely going to find a roster spot in the NFL. So I would say Abram Smith one, Jordan Tiamo two, and then I would switch out Brian Hill for AJ McCarron at three. And uh, the DC defenders offense, man, it, it, even for, for as much running as they do to consistently put up 30 plus and 28 at a minimum. And, you know, to your point about Jordan Tomu, you know, the pressure has been relieved of him of having to carry, you know, that much of a burden in the backfield or, you know, out of the rush attack. And now they have a four headed, you know, rushing Swiss army knife and Raquel Armstead, Abram Smith, Derek King, and Jordan Tomu pretty much built for every situation. And, you know, like it's what you wonder if like, if Houston was to go with a guy like Cole McDonald starting, with the weapon like Max Borgie, if you just played like Grayson McCall at Coastal Carolina, you wonder how they'd even fail to put up like 24 points every game. Well, here's the problem with Houston. Houston has abandoned the running game. That's why they're, they're that's part of their main struggles offensively is that they've completely abandoned the running game. That's what happened against uh, San Antonio. I believe they only ran the ball like 13, 14 times and only got like 23, 24 yards. So I think AJ Smith, who I, I, 
I adore the man as the offensive coordinator I, for Houston. I think he's done a really good job. His number one issue as a play caller is that he does not stick with the running game as much as he should. He's got a really good backfield with a lot of talented backs, but he has not given them a chance to really get into the flow of a game. It takes Houston a long time to going into the game, how, you know, on developing that running game. He's got to be more patient with that because right now with Brandon Silver's not being a hundred percent Cole McDonald, I'm sorry, as a passer, he's he's not ready to really take that starting role. But if you can get that running game going, I think that's going to make a massive difference for Houston. But they have got to trust the running game more. They have the running backs to do it. They have the offensive line to do it. A.J. Smith has just got to stick with it a little bit more because he's prone to throwing the ball 35, 40 times a game. And you're, you're not going to win a lot of games doing that. So he's got to put more faith in his running backs. All right, Anthony. Let's let's close up the XFL talk, and uh, it, we've already we've gone on for half an hour about the XFL, and that's what that's what you'd expect when you said like, "Hey, this will probably be like half an hour." It's like, no, we talked <laughs> yeah. about for half an hour, and, and that's why we do what we do. Um, XFL, who, what's going to be the championship game, and who do you think is taking it? Uh, so championship game. <sighs> Right. I definitely uh, division disparity. Yeah, it, it's really unfortunate. I really hope the XFL will look at their playoff roles moving forward because I, I I think the three best teams in this league all come from the north. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be the DC Defenders. I think it's going to be the Houston Roughnecks, and I think the Defenders are going to win the title. I, I I just think the DC is the most complete team in this league. I think when Houston is able to find a nice balance on offense, that defense is good enough to win championships for them too. But that defense has also had um, some injuries on their side of the ball, especially with their pass rushers. So they got to try to stay healthy on that defensive line. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be Houston. I think it's going to be DC, but DC is just way too good right now. They're just the most complete team in this league. Reggie Barlow, the head coach has just done such a phenomenal job okay. with putting that team together. So I, I, I really like DC. I think they're, they're my pick to win the title. And, you know, they've been a clear number one to me from like really week one. Uh, DC has never looked back. Even the loss to the Guardians, it's like, you know, that's very forgivable. I think that this playoffs is going to be DC and St. Louis. I think, unfortunately, Seattle is going to end up, you know, comically out of this postseason because, unfortunately, they dug themselves just too deep of a hole. Uh, you know, with with too little time left, and I think St. Louis has two winnable games. Uh, you know, they've they've proven when uh, they they are competitive against the upper echelon of the league, and this is a league that has been, you know, dominated by storylines of teams that have wide splits between the the lower half of the league and the upper half. Um, I, I just think maybe Seattle doesn't have enough time left to you know fix the thing. To, to, to gain that ground on St. Louis because St. Louis has remained steady even in a week like last week where they should have been so vulnerable. Um, I think it's Arlington, Houston. I'm, I'm going to hold to this. I think that Arlington is actually trending upward faster than, it, than you know, I think Houston is decaying. And with each week, they've looked a little bit where even Brandon, so, you know, if he's not 100%, then I don't like seeing him in any game. And if Cole McDonald is your top option and you have to go with that, you know, when you were hoping for silvers, I don't think that that's a situation where they're going to develop or, uh, you know, adjust enough to, to use Cole McDonald to his best potential. So I think that's a game that Arlington actually ends up going to the championship. Oh, I'll say it, it could be 15 to 14, but Max... 17 to 14 Arlington if they take that and in the championship game it's going to be DC they have proven time they're the only team in this league that has just a spotless record against the upper echelon and you know a crazy loss to the team with the worst record in the league the Orlando Guardians who on that night I think any of us would have said might be the best team in the league regardless of their record at the time I think then I think DC beats Arlington 28 to 15 in that championship. I, DC is clearly the number one in the XFL. 
Well, keep this in mind, too. If you watched the USFL last year, Birmingham Stallions, their only loss was to the three and seven Houston Gamblers. And Houston only had one win when they played Birmingham. So weird losses happen all the time to good teams. But that doesn't define who the team is. Birmingham still ended up winning the USFL championship. So I, I think I think you're right. I think DC is clearly the best team in the XFL, and they they should be able to win the title. But that that North Division playoff game is going to be so good, no matter who's in it, whether it's Seattle, St. Louis, uh, wh- wh- whoever is going to play DC. That that game is going to be the game of the year, and honestly, the true championship game. And that was what was so great about the last couple of weeks. And I, I think what was it, and that's encouraging because I think it was the quality of the game and the matchup that elevated the ratings and the the fan awareness. But the last two weeks, DC versus Seattle, I was like, ooh, this is gonna be the game of the year. And then leading up to this week of Seattle versus St. Louis, it's like, oh, I cannot wait to watch this one. And that North Division is going to be sick to watch in the postseason, regardless of the matchup. Um, but you know, Anthony, there's another league that's about to start this week. It, it dates back to the 1980s. Donald Trump and almost Congressman Herschel Walker was involved. Several NFL led the USFL. It was a great season last year. It all took place in Birmingham. The Birmingham Stallions brilliantly placed in Birmingham, Alabama. They have established themselves in that city. They're a legit professional sports organization the new jersey generals are you know an american classic and Andy, by the way i'm going to be attending the may 7 double header in canton ohio uh, nice uh, for ten dollars a pop dude that's what american professional sports needs is affordable live sporting events i agree i i think the usfl has and, and look i I have my opinions on the hub cities, but I will say the USFL has been really smart about how they kind of approach their first couple of seasons. They're trying to save money. They're trying to be smart about it. And they're trying to slowly glow, uh, grow this uh, league. And I think they've done a phenomenal job with it. I love seeing the ticket sales, uh, you know, ticket prices being 10, 20 bucks maximum. I think that's, that's massive. I know that the USFL has really pushed for like families to come out and be able to go to a, a, an, a, an affordable game and having cities like Memphis and Birmingham and Kenton who, you know, they don't, they don't have a lot of football. Like they, they, they maybe have their high school football. They may have, you know, some college ball, but they don't have professional teams and being, being able to have a professional team in their backyard. I know is massive for those type of cities. I, I know for Detroit, Michigan, they, they have the Detroit lions, obviously, but I, even for Michigan, they seem to be doing really well in that local market. So that's been, I, I will say the USFL, when it comes down to marketing in their local cities, they have done a really good job. And I would even make the argument they've done a better job than the XFL has in the local markets. I definitely think that dude, it, here's the thing about, um about the XFL is it seems like they were slow to community outreach. It like it seems like something about the fact that The Rock was involved, and it seems like they were leaning way too much on that. Did there in Orlando there should be a free Quentin Dormady poster giveaway every single week at every elementary school. You know, like there should be t shirt. It seems like the USFL has been a lot better about that. Uh, and you know, and you know, having the cities of Birmingham, Memphis, New Orleans, and Houston, there's like a crazy southern rivalry factor involved, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, the fact that Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are both involved, and you know, the New Jersey Generals, a notorious organization, it, it I love that thing about, it. and it's so. You know, it's a tough process to find a city that is both hungry for football and doesn't already have too much of their attention focused on another, you know, another team. And it's why, like, teams in Washington, D.C. tend to have success. Those people love football, but they feel like their organization has been stolen from them. Same, you know, with Birmingham, Alabama and Memphis. You know, they have college football programs local enough to them that they but they've always been destinations uh for alternative league football and so those are like fan bases that are built to appreciate the brand 
So there's a couple of things to think about there. So when it comes down to marketing the local markets, think about this for the XFL. So Mike Mitchell was on the Mark cast about a month or so ago, and he talked about how what the budget was for the XFL in terms of marketing. The, the league is only spending one hundred and twenty thousand dollars on marketing for this first season. What? So they, so they, and and I don't know if it was because they wanted to save money or how they were approaching that, but it, it definitely felt like they wanted to do more of an organic thing, a growth with the marketing their league. So I don't think they wanted to spend as much money. I think they're thinking about the long haul with it. So that that's kind of why, like, you didn't really see the community outreach. I think the big reason why you're seeing it in the USFL, and honestly, I, I really think that this is where a lot of leagues should, you know, if any spring football leagues ever think about this in the future, hopefully these are the two leagues that get it done. But if it isn't, if you start a spring football league, I really do think you need to have a network that's going to be an investor in your league. The one big thing that's really helped the USFL is that Fox is an investor in this league. They have money involved in this. So they they have skin in the game. They need this league to work. So they're going to spend more money when it comes down to marketing the USFL on their networks. It's why I, I, I really do believe the USFL has a better television deal than the XFL because this weekend, three of their four games are going to be on national television. Two of them are going to be on Fox on Saturday. One's going to be on NBC on Sunday. Most of the weeks, I think there's only one week where they have one nationally televised game. The rest of the USFL season, at least two to three games are going to be on national television. And that's because Fox has an invested, you know, they're invested in this league. They need this league to work and having just, and plus they only, they don't have a lot of local markets they need to work into. It's really only like four that they really have to work into. So I think that helps them save money as well when they're marketing into those cities. Yeah, man. Like it's, it really is like the XFL you know, has at least benefited from the fact that people know they can go on the ESPN Plus app and find the XFL games. Um, but, you know, and while they've changed up the days and times that they're playing those games, I think that's something that they need. But with the USFL having more resources, they can, you know, go to Fox and NBC and have a way higher ceiling. Uh, and, you know, it's an established brand. People know the USFL as, you know, it has a slightly, it has a marginally higher qualitative reputation, uh, you know, for various reasons, even though, you know, it's so hard to tell with spring football and with alternative football, you know, like, and especially when a lot of these guys are hopping around to, you know, each other's league. Um, but with the USFL, man, because now the Tampa Bay Bandits are now the Memphis Showboats, rightfully, again, I love Memphis professional sports, the showboats are going to be my favorite team of this year, but at plus 600 or six, plus 650 for the, for the, uh, the freedom cup, I'm not touching them, man. Like I think that there's four really reliable picks in this organization, in this league to make this postseason, And the other teams are going to have to prove me wrong at some point, you know, either through the new coaches that they got, or, you know, the new personnel, but, you know, a lot of those, the strongest teams in this league in Birmingham, New Jersey, New Orleans, and Philadelphia, you know, they have a lot of continuity coming back. And the things that aren't the same are arguably improvements. You know, I would cite, even though he's 35 years old, McLeod Bethel Thompson for the New Orleans Breakers, you know, that could be just the kind of guy that would be great for a new hire in John Filippo, who's bounced around to a bunch of different places as an offensive coach, that may, might be just the kind of leader that they need to propel them to another postseason berth. I 100% agree. I think something also to think about is home field advantage. I think that's why people are, are a little bit higher on the Memphis showboats is because they're actually playing in Memphis. And let's face it, I think the attendance of those games are going to be a lot similar to what we saw with Birmingham, where we're probably going to see – Roughly, I'm probably going on the lower end, twelve to 15,000. I think you could probably see maybe closer to up to the 20,000 mark, which I think that's why people are going to be a little bit higher on Memphis. I, I agree. I like Norris Breakers. I think Bethel Thompson was just a great signing for that team. And, you know, this is for him, this is his last shot of trying to get his foot back in the door in the National Football League. So he's going to be playing with, um, 
a lot of motivation and he's got great receivers. Uh, Jonathan Adams and Johnny Dixon are just phenomenal t- uh, targets at receiver. He, he may have two of the best seven, eight receivers in this league already in on, on his team. So I think that's going to be massive, even though he doesn't have Sal Canelo to throw it to, he's got great receivers. So that breakers offense, that passing game is going to be among the best. So, I, I mean, I think all the teams that made the playoffs last year for the USFL, I see all of them making it again this year. And it's like you talked about, there's just more continuity. There's more stability with those teams than there are with the, the lower end teams. I mean, like the team I'm covering the Houston gamblers, man, they literally only have like four or five players on their defense that's coming back, but their front seven, none of them were on the roster from last season. So that's a team that's going to have a, a rough going. I mean, Pittsburgh and Michigan, I think got better over the off season, you know, with coaching changes, like Ray Horton coming into Pittsburgh, I think is a much better move at head coach. So I really, and then James Morgan's coming in. He looks like he's going to be the starting quarterback for Pittsburgh. I think the Maulers got a lot better. I think that's a team that's going to be a lot more competitive where I can even see them finishing four, six, five, and five. I think Michigan got better. So I think the lower end teams got better except for Houston. I, I'm very scared that Houston may be lucky if they win one game because Michigan and Pittsburgh, I think, significantly improved their teams. Everyone else, I, I think the USFL is going to be more competitive this year than it was last year. Like Birmingham Stallions, I don't know if they're going to go nine and one again. I can really see them going seven and three, six and four. I think it's going to be uh, kind of a tighter race. I think New Jersey and Philadelphia will probably each finish seven and three, six and four. But I, I, I do think the competition is going to be a lot better this year. I think the games are going to be closer. And I think this just because I think the lower end teams got better. I think they got better players. So I think it's going to be tighter competitions this season. And that's the thing with like Birmingham and New Jersey that it's like, I think based on their roster makeup and who is coming back, I feel like there is a higher floor for them for like, I can't see them, you know, being bad teams. I can only see them being less great than they were last year. Philadelphia is the team that like I love at, I think they were at plus 550 to win the championship. I think that that was the best value because of the, full-bodied continuity of you're getting ca- Captain Cook is back at quarterback and the full coaching staff coming back. And, you know, I like a team, even though they were inconsistent during the regular season, the fact that, that they made that run to the championship game and, and you know, played in a very competitive game, that's what made me like them there. But that is the team I feel like I could be the most wrong about. Um, but, you know, take New Orleans, and for folks that don't know, McLeod Bethel Thompson, 35 years old. He is a Grey Cup champion. He had he threw for ridiculous numbers last year in the Canadian Football League. He has been to a bunch of different places. I think the AAF and also played for a Sacramento Indoor Football League. That guy, that's the kind of guy that is dangerous in spring football, man, because he has been everywhere and played under every possible situation. Yeah, just to touch on the Philadelphia and New Jersey situation, because I think those two teams are really interesting. And I think the difference between those teams last year to this year, it's really going to come down to quarterbacks. So Philadelphia's got Case Cook is coming back. Honestly, I think he should have been the MVP last year. Um, or, or, or I should say he should have been the quarterback of the you know all USFL, not Kyle Slaughter. He was by far the... I think one of the top quarterbacks in the league, but for New Jersey, they don't have Louis press anymore. It's DeAndre Johnson's show and DeAndre Johnson's a good quarterback, but he was brought in more for like running situations. He did prove that he can throw the ball with accuracy. He put up decent numbers, but Luis Perez was doing most of the passing. So what's going to make or break New Jersey is can DeAndre Johnson be a consistent passer? Cause he's the number one guy. He's the only guy. They're not going to be switching in and out quarterbacks. They're going to be rolling with him for this season. So he's got to be, be able to fit into Mike Riley's offense and be able to throw the football. So if if he struggles with throwing the football, that's going to be a major problem for New Jersey, despite having a good defense, despite having Derek, uh, uh, Victor in the backfield. Like they, they have a good running game. They have a good offense line, good receiver. Like they have a good defense, but it really comes on DeAndre Johnson. Can he be con- a consistent passer? Because I think that's going to be the difference with Philadelphia. 
Case Cook is, is a great quarterback. He's going to be able to come in there and throw the ball consistently, and he's got good targets to throw it to. So it, it, I think that's going to make the difference. If DeAndre Johnson doesn't play well, I think Philadelphia is coasting through that division. Yeah, and you know I think that's what puts a, a lower ceiling, but the high floor on New Jersey is like, you know, I don't know what DeAndre Johnson is capable of when you know what Luis Perez offers a team. You know, he, he's – He's just so much more reliable. It's how you knew Arlington was in a better offensive state when he ended up going there in that ridiculously silly trade. Um, but, you know, so one point on, you know, Memphis, uh, they've got so many quarterback options, and yet, like, it seemed like they, you know, Brady White was the star, naturally, as being, you know, a, a Memphis Tiger hero uh, from his college days. I... So, you know, I I can't see a team like New Jersey finishing, you know, ending the season as any worse than the fourth or fifth best team in the league. But I don't think they're going to win the championship either way. I, I think Birmingham still has that possibility. Bo Scarborough has turned into a star. Uh, you know, and he that's a name that's getting out there. Uh, and, you know, he had a great season. It That's what, you know, really draws the parallel between Birmingham and D.C., and I think the question with Pittsburgh, I do think Pittsburgh probably, you know, wins three games this year. I think that's how, you know, the parody in the USFL is catching up. They they made an improvement at the coaching position. That's a low bar that they set granted. The, the real problem is their quarterback situation. You know, I think it's better than it was, but I, it still has, I think, the most question marks besides everybody but the Houston Gamblers who, you know, if you would, I'm a Kentucky fan, man. I'm, I I went to Kentucky for four years of undergrad and three years of law school. Touchdown Terry was there during the absolute heyday. I cannot believe he is going to be even a second or third string guy on any professional football league team at this level. But what that guy can do is run. And if they actually decide to use that, that could be what pushes Houston you know, past one or two wins and maybe up into that three to four range. Yeah, I think Houston is really interesting because last season they had so many good defensive players. They had Chris Odom, they had Donald Payne, Reggie Northrup, they had Will Likely, you know, two, uh, three of those guys are in the XFL. Chris Odom, unfortunately, got injured when he was with the Cleveland Browns in preseason, but he's still in the National Football League himself. Like, they had so many good defensive players on that squad. And now this season, and, and it was their offense that was kind of really inconsistent last year. This year, it's really the opposite, where I actually trust the offense more for Houston. And, you know, I like Kenji Bahar. I think he is a solid quarterback. He came in there those last two games. Of the, he started the last three games, went two and one as a starter. And no, I don't think he put up spectacular numbers, but he showed more accuracy than Clayton Thorson did. So, and he's got the ability to bomb it deep when he has to. I love his arm strength. And he's a mobile quarterback himself. He comes from, he was with the Baltimore Ravens. He was behind Lamar Jackson. So I think he is a Lamar Jackson type that just needs to grow um, as a quarterback. Uh, so I, I, I mean, and Terry Wilson, I, I agree. He's a really good quarterback too. I would not be surprised if Terry, Terry Wilson gets some play in time this year. I think the, the quarterback battle in training camp was really between those two, but Kenji Bahar is kind of the more veteran of the prof of the quarterbacks in the professional league. So I think that's why he got the nod, but they're both very similar traits in the way they play. So it could potentially roll out that way. I think they have good receivers, you know, Theo Redding and Anthony Ratliff, Williams, Tyler Palka. They're really good receivers. Brandon Barnes is back at tight end. They got Houston's got four of their five starting offensive linemen back. So that offense is actually really solid for Houston. I think it'll be interesting to see if Terry Wilson gets any playing time at quarterback, but Kenji Barhar is solid, but overall what's going to kill Houston is that defense. I just, I don't have any faith in that defense right now. That looks like a one, two win team and somebody like, you know, Pittsburgh and Michigan, they're going to win more games because I think they're just more balanced with offense and defense than Houston is. Dude, I was just sitting here thinking about one of my like last USFL questions to pose as being who do you think is going to be the more improved team Pittsburgh or Michigan uh and then you say that and I think that it, okay so 
damn it, I got off on that note. And then <laughs> I, I, so let, let's go to that then. Um, you know, for this final question on the USFL, who do you think is the more improved team? You know, who, I would I would say who do you think is going to be the most improved team? But I, I think we both just like telepathically came to a conclusion that it's either going to be Pittsburgh or Michigan. And uh, who do you think wins the championship? And who do you think is the MVP of this league? Uh, Case Cook is going to be the MVP. Um, he's the most complete quarterback in this league. Uh, not only can, does he throw the ball with accuracy and throws the ball well, but he can use his legs at times. He's a playmaker. He's going to be the MVP of this league. And I, I think for the championship, I, I, I'm, I'm so torn on Birmingham or Philadelphia because I think they're both going to play each other again in the championship. And I just have a gut feeling like, and this is something that bothered me last year in the championship game. If Case Cook just didn't get hurt, I think Philadelphia wins that game. I really do. I, I think they were just out playing Birmingham in that game. And then he got hurt and it just all ended from there. So I'm going to say Philadelphia is going to get the revenge on Birmingham in the championship. And I like, I like them winning the title. I think they've, they're going to come back with a little vengeance this year on Birmingham. I think they ended up being the better team the second half of the season. And I, I, I can see them winning the title. And and so to agree on many points, a little preview of my USFL uh, preseason futures and week one betting piece is best bet for MVP, Case Cook is. My bolder bet is McLeod Bethel Thompson. I think if everything does click in New Orleans and John Filippo does turn out to be well-primed for spring and alternative football, then McLeod Bethel Thompson is a guy that, you know, has has a great ceiling as he's shown in the CFL, but Case Cookus has everything there to be, you know, to be much more successful consistently than they were like Brian Scott isn't there. It's Case Cookus. Uh, he seems to be healthy for the start of the season. Every indication seems so. And, you know, as far as, you know, ch championships, uh, and this is one thing that like I had to learn a hard lesson again, writing this preseason futures piece in week one, for USFL, because of the XFL, I, I think I microanalyzed so much stuff. And by week two, the entire league was different. And by week three, it was even more different than it was in week two. So I, I'm i trying to go a little bit more with the flow in this season of the USFL. Things are going to change. But I think the continuity, the things that didn't change in Philadelphia, makes them an absolute bargain to win the championship at plus, fleet, uh, at plus 550. Birmingham and New Jersey, predictably the two most favored teams to win the championship. But I think Birmingham digresses just a little bit from the fact that they're not going to be playing every game in front of a, a passionate home crowd. I, I think that causes enough losses and enough problems. I think Philadelphia will be the most championship ready by the time the playoffs start. They won't have to be a spoiler this year. And I, I think that they're the best value to win the championship. And again, my bolder pick, would then be the New Orleans Breakers. Um, I think that it's in division where I think they can have a lot of success naturally, at kind of not as bad as the, the division split in the XFL. Uh, but things are going to be competitive between Birmingham, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. But New Orleans, with, with what they're going to have at quarterback, uh, I, I think the success that they had last year and anybody returning from last year that's great news for them. And at plus 600, I think they're an excellent value. I agree too. And I love Jonathan Adams. I think he's one of the, I think he's one of the best receivers in this league. He's a big play guy for new Orleans. I can really see him going off this season and having one of his best seasons. I remember watching him in college with Arkansas state and that dude was just making spectacular plays and putting up huge numbers for them. So I, I have loved Jonathan Adams since college. I think he's going to come in in this league. And I would even say he can arguably be, in my running for MVP also. I think he he's going to put up really big numbers. I hope him and Bethel Thompson have a good connection because I think he could be a big-time player. All right, man. So it's something that we, we've both been, uh, you know, just based on our Twitter activity, I can tell we've been focused on a lot is what a great time to be alive it is if you like any sport around the world because it's never been at a, this high of a level in every single country on the planet. We were talking about it earlier this week in Europe. 
the amount of teams that have, you know, legitimate teams that are fun to watch. They're made of high level professional athletes. And these are guys that, you know, were guys that could have slipped through the cracks because they were Juco products or played it in an AIA school. There's the X league in Japan, which has, you know, grown to a much higher level of legitimacy just the last few years. There's a handful of high level indoor football, not to mention, you know, fan controlled football, which garnered, garnered a lot of attention. This is a great time to watch alternative football. Obviously there's never been a better time in, in history to be a fan of spring and alternative football. And I didn't even mention in that breath Canadian football, which starts, I believe, in June. Uh, or the, is that Europe? Either way, they're both starting around that time. What What do you have to say just about where, you know, the sport is at? And, you know, outside of the NFL, for, you know, those that like to follow these guys in college that are unheralded guys that you then get to see start at quarterback or a tight end like Josh Babbage, or running back in these alternative leagues. What are your thoughts on just the state that we're at right now with professional football? Yeah, I'm going to jump on my soapbox a bit here because this is actually, I'm actually really glad you asked this question because I, I kind of wanted to address something that I've seen on Twitter where there seems to be an all out war between USFL fans and XFL fans. And I got to be honest, I, I don't understand it at all. We, yeah. I am, I, I, so. I'm 30 years old. I have been a journalist covering alternative football league since 2019. The, my first recollection of watching alternative football was the XFL back in 2001. I, in my lifetime, and I've watched the UFL, I've watched the Alliance of American Football, I've watched it all. I have, I, I don't think there's ever been a time in my lifetime where we, we have seen two alternative football leagues as big as the USFL and the XFL is literally playing at the same time and competing with each other. This is a, I, I, I don't know if I'm being dramatic about this or not, but this feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity that I don't know how many times we're actually going to see because we haven't seen anything like this before. And I think it's because of the ecosystem of football is just in a really good place right now where there's a lot of good talent out there. There really is when it, it, you know, whether it's they're playing in the indoor football league or playing in Europe or playing in Canada, playing in the US, there is talent all over the world. Football has become more of a global sport than it has been over the last 30, 40, 50 years, where people are starting to buy into American football. They're starting to really understand or Canadian football and starting to really embrace the sport. So I, I really hope that we can take this time to put our differences aside and really embrace what we're about to see this weekend we're about to see four usfl games four xfl games and we're going to see them compete against each other and, and for me i know a lot of people probably think i'm a little more biased towards the xfl and maybe i am just because i have a really close relationship with the league and you know they've been so great to me and stuff like that but i can't tell you how excited i am to watch the usfl this weekend to be able to watch the usfl be able to watch the xfl at the same time like i'm literally going to have multiple monitors up watching games at the same time like this is an incredible moment for football fans and we just really need to embrace this moment so i hope we can put our differences aside forget about you know oh we're you know usfl or we're xfl fan who the hell cares we got more football than we've ever seen before in the spring we just need to sit back turn on the tvs you know turn on another monitor and let's just watch football because i don't know how many times we're going to see this in our lifetime so let's just enjoy the moment this is going to be incredible i'm so excited for this weekend I, i've never been more excited about a weekend of football in my lifetime than this this is going to be awesome to watch the fan beef is so insane it doesn't make any sense how if you're a fan of one spring football league how could you possibly have hatred and contempt for the other one like dude the success of all spring football leagues is good for the other one this is competition that is much needed and, you know, especially when we see what the effect is, what it's like to go to a major league baseball game now, especially now that so many minor league teams have been eliminated, it is not supposed to cost $200 to go to a live sporting event. And that's mm -hmm. why these other leagues are so important, man. And why it was, it blew my mind when I bought those two tickets for that double header 
in the at the Pro Football Hall of Fame for ten dollars a piece. I didn't even have a person to go with yet. Dude, I just bought the other tickets. I was like, worst case scenario, dude, I spent thirty dollars for these two tickets for two football games, and it, that is absolutely insane. And you know, to the credit of the XFL. Well, I do think that they fumbled some of their marketing, a lot of their marketing approach up to, you know, pretty recently. It is the quality of the upper echelon of that league and the surprising emergence of two of the worst teams in the league through most of the season that has ultimately won me over. Because, you know, you watch the early part of the season, it was like, I, I can't tell anything else besides the fact that DC is the best team in the league and Seattle has a really good offense. Other than that, I don't know. But over these last few weeks, d- these games have been electric. The the DC Orlando game, game of the year. And then DC versus Seattle, game of the year. And the USFL, I think, is really well set up this year to, again, win a lot more people over with their quality. And just like in basketball, it happened a little slower for American football because of the nature of the sports and what other countries root for, but it's it's happening with football to where you think about in this country, there's how many JUCO, community college, NAIA, through Division I guys that are all better athletes than anyone I've really ever known closely in my life. That's how many good athletes are out there. And they're starting to fill all of these different leagues And I think it's just going to slowly happen just a little bit more like it does with the most popular sports in the world and soccer and basketball is, you know, those other organizations are going to come along. Yeah. I, 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 so I will say the product on the field is always going to be good, no matter what the athletes, as long as you put them in the right position, as long as they have the right coaching, like the players are there. there. There's a reality when you watch spring football that the business side of it is not going to be done 100% correctly. Like the, the the way the XFL has marketed their league, I don't necessarily 100% agree with it, but they 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 went with their own strategy. And I think they have a plan of attack and people may have their thoughts on the attendance numbers and you know what, what they've done in the television ratings, but there's a, there's a, there's a plan to it, and maybe it wasn't done exactly 100 the right way, but they're going to learn from their mistakes and they're going to grow from it in season two. USFL went through the same thing last year. USFL put chips in their footballs and were injuring their kickers every time they were hitting it, but they learned their lesson. They they made a mistake, they acknowledged it, and they fixed it. So I, I think that's something you got to think about with these leagues is they're they're going to make mistakes, but you know, they're, they, they will learn from it and they will grow from it and they will be better for it. The one thing that's always going to be constant and it's going to be consistent is that there's enough good athletes. There's enough good players out there that you're going to be able to field a good football team and you're going to be able to get a good, put a good product on the field. I think the XFL and the USFL have proven that the XFL, I really think the product on the field for the XFL has been probably the best I have ever seen. In spring football, I would make the argument last year, the USFL was pretty close to that too, where before the XFL season, I thought the USFL had the best product on the field. So these, these, te- these leagues are doing a phenomenal job of getting the right coaches in place, getting the right players on the field, and they're putting a really good product on the field. They just need to figure out the business side. And that's all you really need to do with the spring leagues. If you can figure out wh- what's the right approach to the business side, these leagues are going to succeed, but there, it's going to be trial and error. There's going to be mistakes made. You just kind of have to understand not everything's going to be a hundred percent perfect. And, and that's fine. I think you should be okay with that. The USFL hasn't been perfect. The XFL hasn't been perfect, but they're going to learn from it. They're going to grow from it. And they're going to be able to build around what they have because the product on the field is already good for both leagues. It's, it's so interesting to talk to you, Matt, because like, there's, as you know, there's such a wide spectrum of opinions out there just on the XFL and USFL. It's been crazy, just the hostility. I can't believe that anybody who's a fan of one is not a fan of the other. Um, but you know, absolutely, the the XFL, they it, it's, I, I there's been such a focus on what's been going wrong. Uh, and but now, you know, things have taken an uptick when that really should never happen. Your ratings should really never go up, and they did. Uh, it's, I and you know one thing about the USFL. I love how they did the college draft. I hope that the XFL starts to do something similar. I I think that you know any 
any publicity that you can get from, you know, giving attention. And not only that, you know, it's just smart for the teams. I, there's so many guys that fall through the cracks, dude. And this is a time in the, you know, in 2023, back in the day, scouts would have to drive 600 miles to watch someone that they heard a rumor about or saw a box score about in the newspaper. Now, I can go on ESPN Plus on a given weekend and watch Valdosta State play Colorado Mining. So it's it's a great time to be alive if you're a fan of any sport. And Anthony, it's been so fun having this conversation with you, man. And everybody, go check out Anthony Miller. He's got a lot of alternative and spring football stuff going on. There's so much going on with it right now. And it's been a mad dash to educate myself as fully as I can on the things that I'm trying to expand to you like uh, the ELF in Europe. But Anthony, thank you so much for being here. If there's anything you want to say, anybody you want to shout out, the floor is yours. No, I would just say, you know, please check out our work on XFL News Hub, USFL News Hub, CFL News Hub. We got a lot of great writers that are doing awesome work there. Mike Mitchell is the GOAT of uh, writers, reporters for alternative football. He's doing a, amazing stuff there. There's a lot of great writers from Andrew Burry to Pat to uh, to everyone there. So I know I'm forgetting names. I feel really bad. There's a lot of Matts on our team. There's there, there, there's so many writers that write for those sites. So really go follow their work. They're they're awesome guys. Um, so I, I just follow their work there. We're, we're, we're doing great stuff. And I really hope that everyone has a chance to read up on it and please support these leagues. These, these, these leagues really need, um, us to back them, whatever league it is, put your differences aside and let's just enjoy football this weekend. The personalities out there, Anthony Miller of the USFL News Hub and XFL News Hub. There's the Mark Cast doing great work. You know, they, there's there's a lot of people out there that are really connected to the league. You're a wealth of information every day, man. Uh, folks, support spring football. Thanks for listening. This has been another interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. This is going to be a great week of XFL and USFL football, man. I'm so excited. It, it's been a, a blast to talk about. We went about 45 minutes over the time we initially estimated. Thanks for listening, folks. Support Alternative and Spring Football. Tune in this week into a variety of networks. Peace.